Okay, so I feel like I don't have much to say about this, but I have even more notes than my Corrupted Blood episode, and we know how that went, so I should, I should be adequately prepared. Don't forget, we have to do a random Wikipedia uh, article. Too. Yeah, 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 well, That's my goal for these episodes is an hour and a half, so we Each? gotta work up to it, yeah. No, not tonight, but like I'm saying eventually. Like by episode 50, these things better be like two hours long. Why? Because that's all great podcasts are that long. Really? Not really, no. But a lot of them. That's Conflict like of interest. Yeah, I don't actually have that goal. No, I was kind of hoping this... this uh, Or like working on... This podcast would morph into kind of like a variety show where like we talk about obscure things and then maybe like sing songs and like do a like a, a I serial a puppet show we do like a serial radio. audio drama right you do some puppet shows right um that's just like the sound of like like fabric yeah fabric wrestling are we rolling yeah we are okay oh, good I, I think so i'm gonna start by setting the stage the locale of of today's topic have you ever heard of the yap main islands i have not heard of the yap Main islands. They're part of the Federated States of Micronesia, so I know I you're have, excited. I would have expected you to know what the Yap Islands are, but I think you need to say your name. Oh, oh, right, right, right. Unless we're not yeah, gonna do that anymore. Let's back up a little bit. Well, you know, you gotta get, you just gotta maintain. Well, anyway, we don't have to maintain anything. <laughs> we can do whatever we want. <laughs> Go ahead and say your name if you want. Uh, no, I want you to say your name because you're the one that's 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 talking. excited okay. about the Yap Main Islands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, before we go travel to the Yap main islands, uh, we'll me we'll mention briefly that this is the Obscure Gami podcast. Yes. Where we talk about obscure things. Yes. Which, you know, I'm trying to get to. Um, <laughs> got a lot to cover here. Yeah. And apparently, you don't want these to be like <laughs> two hours. So right, yeah. We got to we gotta keep it keep yeah, moving. We gotta... I'm Thomas. I'm Ben. That's Ben. And uh, he's Thomas. Yes. And uh, yeah, we're gonna be talking about an obscure one uh, this week. At least I think it's obscure. This sounds you haven't even obscure. heard of the island that this topic comes from, so yeah. hopefully we're on the right track. I think we are definitely on the right track. Um, so <laughs> what, what micronation did you say it was? Uh, the Federated States of Micronesia. Micronesia. Yeah. Is that like near Indonesia, or is that a totally separate thing? Uh, th it's this sp specific. Uh, it's in the Western Pacific Ocean. Okay. Um, this specific island, the Yap main islands, are located between Guam and Palua. Okay. So Guam, Guam. By the way, I'll plug my future, my future episode about the uh, the capture of Guam. Is that uh, episode forty seven? Episode no, that is not actually on episode forty seven. I thought that was our designated episodes for future. <laughs> no, that's 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 the designated episode about sheep. About sheep. Yeah, is episode obscure, 47. obscure breeds of sheep. Man, I thought we talked about episode 47 last episode. <laughs> we did. Oh, yeah. was it about sheep? <laughs> Almost certainly not. <laughs> right. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. in the future... Capture At some point in the future, I'm probably going to talk about the capture of Guam, because that's an interesting story, but that's not this episode. So in between the islands of Guam and Palua, we've got the, the Yap main islands. Yes. Um, Why are they the main islands? Well, I'm assuming there's... there's Are there, like, minor islands? There's minor... Island, yep, minor islands. Uh, there's, like, the main and the side and the dessert... Yeah. Islands? Yeah. There's a lot dessert of... Dessert islands. In my, re in my research of this topic, I came across a lot of vagary uh, okay. and com conflicting information. Um, Good to so, know. So, yeah. So, I'm going to just give a few little... A little tidbit about the Yap Islands because they in, a, in and of themselves are kind of obscure. I do think we need a little bit of background on Yap before we get and into then the, your, the your you actual want, topic. You want to know about the Yappies people? They're, they're called the Yappies. The Yappies, yeah. They are their own people. They're not part of a larger people group. No, they are the Yappies. They are the Yappies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so the, the Yappies have a caste ranking system where an entire village assumes a rank in the caste. And the, the the villages would rise or fall in the castes, uh, depending on how that specific village fared in the intervillage conflict on the islands, um, which I thought was interesting. And it's it a, is interesting. It's a seven le level caste system. But so are there like seven villages? 
No, I, I'm assuming there's more than. There's lots that don't. There's lots. They just fall into those categories. Right. They just fall into those seven so levels. So is it like those those seven levels are like um, e each village can be like the whole village is in one cast? Yes. Yeah. Your village would be in a specific level of the cast. Right. And then if you you know win some little fight with you know this say you're a level six well we'll, we'll say your village is a level five mm -hmm. and you go head to head with some like level six village and you really like show them who's boss then you move up a level and they would move down a level oh wow yeah um and so it's not really like a social cast in the sense that it that like yeah, it's not individuals. It's, right. It's village. The whole village falls into one level of the yeah. cast. I guess which I'm I thought having was difficulty interesting. wrapping my head around that. Yeah. I did not extensively research the cast system, so that's about all I know that's about it. for episode 47. Right. Um, the, the only other tidbits I know um, is that, like, depending on what level of cast you were in, that could have had an impact on what you could have harvested uh, what resources you could have harvested so you would have been you would have possibly been prohibited from harvesting the best fish or cr resources on the island if you were of one of the lower caste hmm. levels who enforces that like I'm, the I'm assuming the, the higher caste. the higher castes yeah <laughs> um the german settler there were german settlers on the island in the early 20th century uh -huh. and they when they uh settled on the island they they put a ban on inter-village violence, uh -huh. and, which apparently was effective, and it locked it locked down the caste system uh -huh. because n nobody was moving. Nobody was moving anymore, right. and to this day, the villages are locked in their caste their huh. their caste systems that they've been in since they stopped fighting, which was was curious to me. I don't know if the caste. They settled has, in the 20th century? In the early 20th century, yeah. Hmm. So, I don't know, you know, how much the caste system impacts the islands anymore, but they are, they still acknowledge what level of caste you're in, and there's no way to change that at this point. I guess except hmm. to move to another village. So, is there, like, r roughly, what's the size population that we're talking about? Um, yeah, that's, you know, we'll do some brief research. I didn't. I didn't get to that. I was too excited about the, the actual the actual topic, yeah. which we've been passing over for right. ten minutes. Total area, uh, one hundred and eighteen square miles, and population two thousand ten census eleven thousand. So gotcha. we're talking about a pretty small yeah group of islands and group of people. Um. So, moving on to the real interesting, uh, bit of this or my main topic here which is the the currency that the yap people used there's some dispute about what to call these this money um some some people say fei f e i and mm -hmm. some people say rei r a i it, d depending on the documentation you look at apparently it comes from in addition to the German, in addition to the German settlers, there were other settlers or other people who interacted with the, the people on the island, and the different settlers called them different things. Mm -hmm. Potentially, is one explanation for the di differing names. Um, another is there may have been multiple types of currency. Mm -hmm. um, that it's now unknown exactly what the distinctions were, um, but the names may have been different depending on what type. Uh, but these fey, uh, this currency were these slabs of stone. So if you can imagine like a millstone, mm -hmm. but thinner, maybe like six inches thick at the thickest. Um, and they, they had a small hole in the middle, um, maybe a foot across or less. Like how big? And how they ranged, they ranged in size. From, they measured them by fathoms, which would be uh, the arm span of, <laughs> of one of the men. And they ranged from less than one fathom to up to three fathoms. 
So some of the largest face stones were up to like 12, 12 feet in uh, diameter. They were mined from a smooth white sandstone mm -hmm. on the island, on the Palua Islands, uh -huh. 300 miles to, I think, the south. So the, the, the stones that they used for their currency did not even originate on the Yap Islands. Mm -hmm. They would travel to Palua, quarry them there, and haul them back on um, canoes, these like ocean canoes. 300 miles through the ocean and uh, and bring them back to the island which I guess played a role in the the value of them because yeah. it was such it, it was such a um, arduous task or, yeah it was so hard to to obtain them yeah um, but if the I guess the it wasn't that valuable of a material because you had to have a lot of it for it to be worth anything? Yeah, there's some, the, the origin is, is not known. It's not well documented. Nobody knows why. And it's shrouded in a lot of mythery and, and such. Um, yeah, it's not really known why. There's speculation that it started out as like a smaller, it's also known that they used kind of smoothed, um, hewn out like pearl shells uh -huh. for currency and it's it's speculated that it kind of started off with At smaller stones and just sort of expanded <laughs> as people tried to <laughs> obtain more and more wealth um, well it sounds like they're pretty based on their what we know of their caste system that they're a pretty competitive society right yeah so like i wonder if it was like one caste was like bring back a big stone that was like slightly bigger yeah and then the next cast was like well i'm gonna make our money even bigger yeah and it just became a thing where just it was kind like of there ballooned. was just it, it just got more and more competitive to see who could bring yeah. back the biggest stones until these these stones surprisingly it's it's hard to kind of approximate how much they were worth um like how much a 12 foot fay might have bought you <laughs> um there's one account which seems to indicate that a larger stone may have bought you as much as um, a pig. One a pig? pig? Yes. One pig. Yeah. Or um, approximately for a 12 foot fay. Uh, or one, one fat. One pig, 50 baskets of food. Um, yeah, a 100 pound pig or 1,000 coconuts are kind of. Some mm. of the things, that, examples that were given of what you might be able to That's buy a with like a larger stone metric. So it, yeah. it's not like, it's not like your five dollar bill is huge, right? You're, it's more like a hundred. Yeah, yeah. But even even the smaller currencies uh, would have been fairly large. Like most, right. the majority of these stones were like of the three foot or larger size. Gotcha. Um, and they hauled them around. They would stick a stick through the the hole in the middle, and a couple guys would would carry them. Um, <laughs> a couple guys, yeah, would carry your money around. Well, that's the that's this is the, probably the most interesting bit of this whole thing is once they got them to the island, mm -hmm. they often wouldn't move at all. They would leave them in the location of the original owner oh. and simply pass around the ownership of the stone so a given stone was might... it represented by anything no the there was, it was completely a verbal um verbal. sort of contract system huh. where they would just maintain an agreement of so it... who owned any given stone yeah. so it's basically like a bank it's basically like a bank yeah or well, like, like a... if you have bbnt and i have bbnt right and like i owe you money yeah i give you the money through my bank right but and like they, the money is still in the bank right and bb and t just writes you know moves a few numbers right. and some accounts and then like the money is passed from you to me but they did that in a really primitive way where yes. there was like no documentation yeah it was all verbal agreement wow so much so the we the weird the the extent to which this went was there there's an account of a of an instance where 
um, a family had gone to Palua and harvested a stone. And on their way back, they lost it in a storm. Mm -hmm. And um, when they returned to the island, they all gave an account of how magnificent and enormous this stone was. Mm -hmm. And it was it was generally agreed upon by the the, the islanders that them losing it in the ocean, the, the the work of of quarrying the stone had already been done. Right. So just because they lost it in a storm, to no fault of them, it's to no fault of value. theirs, it still had value. And so they continued to trade on this stone uh, at the bottom of the ocean that no one had seen. Um, and and apparently this went on for generations. So like by the time this what? story was relayed to a settler who had documented it, uh -huh. it was three generations deep from the people who had quarried the stone. Yeah. So there was some stone, ass assumedly, you know, unless probably they just dissolving. lied about it, laying at the bottom of the ocean, probably dissolving. Because you said it was sandstone, right? Sandstone, yeah. So it could have easily broken up at yeah. that time. There, well, it was sandstone, again, conflicting accounts as to like what exactly they were. Right. I, I read some things that seemed to indicate that like, some of them were made of different things and what they were made of right. may have um, influenced how much it was worth the more difficult to quarry yeah. stones. Either you know. either the Yat people are an exceptionally trusting people or we had one really untrustworthy fisherman that right. told that story to the guy that documented it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um Either way, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, and it just—that's a great story. It just—it's—it's it's cited in it, the the way I originally um, found out about this. The the Yap Stones was in a book. Your doctor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry that's, that's to inform a, you. That's you, that have, you, yap, have, you have you have Yap Stones. stones. <laughs> they're they're uh, three fathoms wide. <laughs> And land at the bottom of an ocean. <laughs> Possibly terminal. But the good news is you can still there's a silver on lining. You can still buy up to a hundred pound pig with your yap stone. Or a thousand coconuts if that's the way, you know. Yeah. If that's the way you like to roll. Yeah. Um the way I the way I found out about this was in a book um about a great book about Bitcoin called mm -hmm. uh something cryptocurrency we'll put a link in the in the show notes yes um hand hand crafted by uh ben page and found at obscuragami.com uh but anyway i was reading this book and they were using this th these stones as an example of um trust-based currency um because there's basically there's two theories of currency you know fiat currency which is trust based currency and backed i forget the technical name for it but currency that's actually backed in something of value um and uh what this, would be like examples uh like if you were trading actual gold coins right or or even that well, has an inherent there's, value there's, in and of there's itself shades of gray in between too right. so like if you had a gold backed dollar right um that's still you're you're still trading something of relative value right. whereas bitcoin something like bitcoin is purely trust based right in that you know it's just numbers on paper and we all agree that those numbers are worth money and so right they are um and in, in the same way like the people just agreed who owned the stones and how much they were worth, and yeah. so they were. Right. Um, the last thing I'll cover is there was a particularly clever Irish American adventure adventurer who uh, who settled on the island and leveraged his superior boating and qu and quarrying technology uh, to start hauling bay <laughs> uh, <laughs> stones for the yappies. And made quite a bit of money doing this because they would <laughs> basically he would um, he would quarry the stones, bring them over to the island, trade them for coconut um, copra, uh, which is like a dried coconut meat 
Mm -hmm. and uh and then he would take that back in large quantities and trade it in other areas but apparently Mm -hmm. he he did this for quite a while um until his from whenever he got to uh the app islands until his death and and effectively kind of like lowered the overall value yeah i would imagine so uh of their currency because he just he just flooded the market flooded the market with yeah essentially printing a lot of money right yeah yeah huh that's fascinating his name was david sean o'keefe david sean o'keefe yeah sort of a gregor mcgregor type of character not really but there is sounds sort of like there is a lot of uh uh legend surrounding him apparently there was a movie made about him so when did they stop using this currency or do they still use it um the the ownership of the currency is still recognized to this day Mm -hmm. uh but i i don't believe it's it's you know used anymore um much like the caste system right so it's it's still there but it's kind of like a tradition more than a some of their actual functioning there's a couple there's a couple stones in uh the smithsonian's possession as well as just i'm sure a littering of larger ones that remain about the the island in various places do you have some images that we can look at yeah, and that we yeah. can list link to in uh, the show notes as well there's a wonderful um 88 page pdf if you're really curious about this type of thing we will link to it in the show notes. yeah it pretty much covers um everything you could possibly want to know about the fey money um and we're waiting it, for it to load here yeah it also includes some some illustrations and uh pictures as well so i recommend going to the show notes at www.obscuragami.com <laughs> and checking those out Oh, this web page does not have pictures. That was uh, a cool web page, though. Here, I know there are some. Here's one. Oh, there's there's a good that's, one. That's that's an eight foot, uh, Rye Ray Great Scott. That is a thing to behold. It sort of looks like something that Fred Flintstone would use to buy a soda. <laughs> <laughs> that's a smaller one. They don't have any like. Yeah, it wasn't the only thing that they used as currency. There okay. Were, there were other. They had five types of money apparently one for <laughs> almost every cast <laughs> yeah one for almost every cast what other things did they use for money just um, more traditional yeah a lot of it was pearl shells yeah uh, you mentioned that smaller at the stones i didn't i didn't research those stuff of, because, of value yeah, oh there's, there's some guys carrying them. there's uh looks like about six guys with one strung <laughs> up on a pole carrying it he so. looks like he's been conquered the guy that's hanging on the pole <laughs> It looks like they just, like, somebody from one of the other casts caught him and his money. <laughs> so. Well, sir, that was a good a, topic. Quite a curious. You found a good one there. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun to research because I, I read, like, a, basically all that was in that Bitcoin book was the story about the one that was at the bottom of the ocean. Mm-hmm. And just, like, a brief description of it. So it was fun to learn more It was about fun it. to learn more about it. Yeah. I definitely... Uh, I think it's cool how like we think that we have these economic ideas but even even those are not new like right. that even yeah. that idea of like that there was money that was just sat in an, an area where it couldn't be yeah pilfered and people would just exchange ownership yeah it's pretty extraordinary well it's it's in a it, primitive society it's interesting and i think it, it's so significant and this currency the the fey currency is used as an example in a lot of books about economics and, and money because people argue about what like systems of currency and whether fiat currency can even work and stuff like that that and it's it's like at the end of the day you can argue about the merit but like there's examples of things like that actually actually working and just you know the power of trust and agreement Mm -hmm. um and really it it makes a lot of sense like at the end of the day even our even something like gold if we're you know using a gold coin as money we still 
value that that currency because yeah. we've agreed that gold is a valuable thing. Right. You know, if if I don't value gold and right. I disagree with you, I'm not going to take it. Or maybe I will because other people value it. Right. Um, what, yes, indeed. What jurisdiction are they under? Um, Do they currently self-govern? Uh, well, they're, the country is the Federated States of Micronesia. Gotcha, gotcha. Which, whose motto is peace, unity, and liberty. That's their national anthem. That was uh, good. Shout out to uh, the Outer Yepies. Yeah, yeah. For their good. contributions. I am, I'm assuming that's the non-main islands. Of, right. Non of, of Yap. Yeah. Yap. <laughs> Well said. Well, I have a lot of trust in you that we can uh, do a random... Random Wikipedia. Wikipedia uh, page. This is the the portion of the program where we push the magic button and see what happens. Yeah. On the website of Wikipedia. This is the... uh, Oops. You pushed it. (laughs) I pushed it. Quite accidentally. And indeed, we ended up with... Another gem. Trey... Delinquentes, a Spanish that right. rap song by Delinquent Habits, I'm assuming is a Spanish rap band, if you call it a band, rap group, perhaps, uh, released in both Spanish and English in 1996. It, sapl- it samples, <laughs> <laughs> it saps, uh, it samples the jazz song, The Lonely Bowl, prefer- performed by Herb Alpert. I think that would be Herb, Herb Alpert. Herb Alpert. It's uh, 4 minutes and 12 seconds. It was released under the label RCA on Compact Disc, uh, produced by Albert and Jerry Moss, and written by Soul Lake. This is a very short article. And I just read you the entirety of the Wikipedia article. Hmm. That was handy. I think we should listen to a little bit of the original version. Oh, yeah, the the, the uh, Lonely Bowl. Well, I I think we should probably sample. Let's see... uh, Let's see if we can find something here. But, you know. Oh, oh, it's blocked in our country. YouTube, why? This is uh, on the... Oh, this, you uh, said this came out in 1996? In 1996, um, you can find the video under Delinquent Habits Vivo. It actually has 2 million views, which seems to indicate not an obscure song. Yeah. Or relatively unobscure. <laughs> See if we can come across the lonely bowl. I have to admit, I find it kind of soothing. This would be the lonely bowl. This is, yeah, this is the lonely bowl. The song originally, or the original song sampled in Delinquent Habits. Trust the, the, the three delinquents. I believe would be the English translation translation. of yeah if you're in the mood for a good slideshow of bulls look up the lonely bull by by Herb Herb Alpert Alpert and the Tijuana Brass well I think that uh, pretty much wraps us for uh, this episode let let partner I think it's time for us to ride off into the sunset yeah we'll let the lonely bull astride our lonely bull play us out remember even if you lose your wallet in the bottom of the ocean, you still might be able to uh, trade on that credit. If you can get the rest of your village to agree. My favorite part of that is <laughs> is like just imagining them coming back and they're all just like, we had this amazing stone. <laughs> we lost it in the ocean. And everybody else is just standing around. They think about it and they're like, well, like, can't blame you. Yeah. What, can, what, what are you going to do? do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it didn't play us out. Yeah. It ended. Well, you're assuming. But I mean, maybe maybe we just, like, cut it. I, I think that the podcast is still going, but you as the editor know better. So if you have feedback or whatnot, or, you know... 
you lost one of your yap stones at the bottom of the ocean you want to tell us about it what why else might people want to email us um if they want to buy something from us with using their yap stone currency right we will honor we do accept Yapstone currency. We do accept. Provided that your Yapstone is at the bottom of the ocean. Right. <laughs> we don't accept ordinary Yapstones yeah. from the beach. Yeah. Um, and none of those phony, uh, you know, David O'Keefe Yapstones. No, none of those. Has to be hand. Hand hewn. <laughs> hand hewn from the land of Poye. Hand hewn <laughs> and, <laughs> and lost at sea. Just like this podcast. Just like this podcast. <laughs>